Sydney Van Boat was a Charleston County School District teacher for over a decade. Now she wants to take her classroom experience to the boardroom to become the next Charleston County School Board member to represent District 7, West Ashley. I talk one-on-one -on -one with Sydney for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Sydney Van Boat, welcome to Quentin's Close-Ups. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. Oh, I appreciate it greatly. I know that on April, uh, Friday, April 15th, that is, you actually filed at the Charleston County Board of Elections to be placed on the ballot for the Charleston County School Board, obviously District 7. And I know that you were a teacher at Goodwin Elementary in North Charleston since 2010. But I also know that you left at the end of the school year and will actually run on a platform, obviously, of putting students' needs first, transparency to the public, and providing a safe place for teachers to come with their concerns. Let me ask you this. Why Sydney Van Bulk? Why now for school board? Yeah, so um, like you said, I was a teacher for 12 years. And um, in 2014, Meeting Street opened at Brentwood. And um, I'm not here to say anything negative about that school in particular, but the effects that it had on the other schools in North Charleston. And so in my fourth year of teaching, I learned really quickly that teaching is political, that education is political. And I started advocating for my students then. And four years into teaching to become an advocate is um, kind of unheard of, but something like sparked inside of me. And I knew that if I wanted to make a difference for my children, it couldn't just be in the classroom. I had to expand um, outside of those four walls and speak on their behalf. And the more I started speaking out, the more I realized that when teachers speak out, um, the district doesn't always look highly on that. And uh, so in 2016, I was like, hmm, maybe I'll run for school board. And then I realized that if I did, I would have to stop teaching. And I was like, well, I can't do that. Like teaching is my life. Teaching is my passion. Um, there's just no way. Well, flash forward to now, we've been through some of the hardest years of teaching. Um, and not only that, but the price of housing in Charleston keeps rising and rising. And I'm a single income household and it's just, un I just can't afford to be a teacher anymore. And so I made the really difficult decision to walk away, to walk out of the classroom. And that was devastating to me. I, um, if I'm being honest, I cried for weeks. And then again, I cried for weeks at the end of the year. Um, but one morning I woke up and I just realized, you know, like you're an advocate, you're a teacher, you know, this district inside and out. There's no one that's more passionate that cares more about these students or these families than you, you need to do this. And so I decided to step up and here we are today. And going back to Brentwood, Ms. Sydney, you, you talked about obviously the effect on, on the other schools. What exactly is that current effect right now? Yeah, so the immediate effect was that it cut our students almost in half. So we went from a school that was overcrowded. We were about 600 students at the time. And I guess not really quite in half. Um, Goodwin now has about 400 plus students. And because of that, we begin to lose resources. So like just right now, um, our assistant principal just retired. And that position the district was giving us, even though we didn't necessarily qualify for an assistant principal based on the number of students. Mm -hmm. Well, now we're, I say we, um, but I'm not there anymore, but Goodwin is having to fight to get an assistant principal to replace our old one. Um, and we don't know if they're going to get one or not. Um, and I can tell you <laughs> that absolutely 100% that school needs an assistant principal. Mm -hmm. And so just because um, when you lose students, you lose resources, you lose allocations, but that doesn't mean that you don't need that anymore. Like we don't have full-time mental health at Goodwin. Um, and that's absolutely an important thing. And so, uh, 
in our special area times got cut, those kind of things. So um, I looked at the budget last night. I went through it line by line and um, from the district, so not even the money coming into Brentwood from outside, but from the district, they get almost three times as much money as Goodwin does. Um, and so that was shocking to me. Um, and that's true for most of our schools. Like they're bringing in way more money than our schools are. So, And going to District 7, Smith Sydney, how many of those schools there are actually bringing in more money for the school district? Well, it, so basically you're, you're supposed to get allocated per student. You're supposed to get a certain amount of money per student. But if you're looking at the actual budget, it doesn't necessarily seem like that's what's happening. Mm. And so, um, and I could be wrong. I have not sat in the budget meetings. I don't know. Um, but the math doesn't seem to add up to me. Um, and so that's something that we really need to look at and make sure that each one of our students in the district is getting the same equal education. Where is the equal education right now in District 7? Well, what I can tell you about District 7, which is really frustrating and it's something that I want to focus on, is that there's not a single student in District 7 that is being offered a traditional K-12 education. So what I mean by that is that we do not have a functional traditional 6 through 8 middle school. Um, in West Ashley. Um, right. Now, we do have one neighborhood in North Charleston, which I think is super important that we don't leave them out of the conversation. It's very easy to spend all of our time focusing on West Ashley because that's the largest part of our district, and it's very important. That's where the majority of our schools are, but we do have this neighborhood in North Charleston as part of the district, and I don't want them to get left out of the conversation as well. Now, this neighborhood is zone for meeting street at Brentwood. And I want to be really clear to any voters that live in that neighborhood that if they are happy at Brentwood, then I absolutely want them to have that opportunity to continue to go there. My issue is that they don't have the opportunity to go to a traditional neighborhood school without having to do choice school. Mm. And so, um, to me, that's an issue as well. Like they should have the app. They should absolutely have the option to go to a traditional neighborhood school if they want to. Um, and then our West Ashley students deserve the opportunity to go to a traditional middle school. Right now, we have um, 764 students that are zoned in and going out. That's a problem when we. When the district was talking about building the new school, they kept saying, oh, well, we don't need a bigger one. A 600 student school is fine because we're not growing fast enough. If we provide, they will come. And that's the issue is that right now we have a PR problem in West Ashley where there's this conversation around how some of our schools are not good, how some are better. Um, we're losing schools students to charter schools, which is fine. We have some great charter schools in West Ashley. We're losing students to private school. There's not a whole lot we can do about that. That's a parent's choice. But when we talk about our neighborhood schools in West Ashley, we need to be talking about all of the amazing things that they're doing. The conversations around these schools are unfair. They're tilted. And because of that, families are missing out on the opportunities that we have right here in West Ashley. And because of that, we are preventing more opportunities. If we could build these schools, if we could build this school, if we get two strong six through eight middle schools with equal opportunities and both of them, I would I would bet a lot of money that a lot a large portion of that seven hundred and sixty four students would zone back into West Ashley. And so we need to really change the way we're talking about our schools because what we need to focus on is all the things that we can give back to our students and to our families. Now, in District 7, Miss Sydney, how many students have the Charleston County School District have actually lost to the charter schools? 
So to the charter schools specifically, I would have to look up that number for you. Um, there, if you go to the CCSD, I have, I mean, I don't have it right in front of me, but, um, if you go to the CCSD website, it's hidden. Um, I actually had to get a friend to help me find it yesterday. Um, I was looking, um, for quite some time to find it, but there is a whole list that goes through every school and how many students are zoned in and zoned out. So I could get you that number. Um, I don't know specifically off the top of my head, but it's a pretty large number because we have several strong charter schools in West Ashley. Okay, let me ask you this. What are the last figures for the population for District 7? Yeah, so um, we have about... Um, 14, almost 4,000 students that are zoned in that are attending out. Um, and that's about half. And so, um, rough number about 8,000. Now, uh, how many, of the, uh, let's talk about the parents of the, in the adults and the taxpayers here. Yes. How many of those residents in District 4, uh, District 7, that is, have you all lost in the past four years? So, yeah, the, we've lost 4,000 students. And like they, we need to do something about that. We need, they're zoned in and they're attending out. So the question is why? And honestly, the more I talk to teachers, the more I talk to residents here in West Ashley, right. um, it's really a PR issue where there's all, there's, uh, there's misinformation about what's going on in our schools and we need to change that conversation. What? What will be the conversation about District 7 in the next four years? Yeah, so um, the districts changed their um, literacy program to EL. Um, and I can only speak for the school that I was in, which was in North Charleston. But the results that we were seeing with the EL program is amazing. Um, our students are really thriving. Um, I taught preschool, so my students didn't do EL. But we were using Bridges, which is an incredible math program. Um, I am not someone that loves curriculum. I like if it, I like when teachers have the autonomy to teach in their style, their way. Um, but math was something that I kind of struggled with teaching. And Bridges, really, I was amazed at the progress that my four-year-olds were making in one year. So one year of implementing. And we know um, statistics tell us it takes two to three years to see real change when you switch over to a new curriculum. So even in the one year that we were using Bridges, I was astounded at what was happening with our students. And so I think that if parents can see um, the actual learning and not just looking at standardized testing, but the actual student, the actual growth, if we can talk about um, the extra programs that are going on during school, after school, uh, if we can talk about the sports programs, if we can talk about all of the different opportunities that we're offering students, I think it would really change how parents perceive our West Ashley schools. Uh, take take um, the Center for Advanced Studies at West Ashley High School. It is state of the art. I mean, I when I, I took a tour about a month ago through it, and which I'm a little ashamed that I hadn't done it sooner, but as a teacher, I didn't have a whole lot of free time. Um, but it's incredible. And it, if every single student knew that those opportunities were there for them, I think I think if parents knew that those opportunities were there for their students, they would want to put their kids back into our public school system. Like, I wish that I had those opportunities when I was in high school. Um, it's, I'm just amazed at what we're offering our kids. Now, what are you? What opportunities are there right now for the uh, District 7 uh, students? And if their parents were to put them back in those programs, how many of those students would actually uh, be back in, into the, that district itself? Well, that's going to come down to the parents, obviously. You know, there's a lot of different reasons why parents might pull their children out. Um, you know, Charleston County does a really good job of promoting some of their other schools. So um, I think that 
if we can just reroute the messaging and really show parents what we have to offer here already, um, they're not all going to come, you know, like there's definitely, we're, we're never going to get every single parent and that's okay. Not, not every child is going to thrive in the same environment. So, you know, the goal doesn't necessarily have to be, oh, 100% of our students stay. But what we do want to do is make sure that 100% of our students are aware of what we can offer them. And, you know, the, for the Center for Advanced Studies is incredible. Like, um, just West Ashley High School is incredible. Um, and so the fact that we have... Um, we have 799 students that are zoned for West Ashley High School that are not attending the year. And so I think that it's important that we sit down and figure out why they're not attending there. But, um, and then see if, if there's something that we can do to change that. And where exactly are these current students going right now? Half of the 700 that are zoned in for those schools. Yeah, um, it would be. I would say probably a large portion of them are going to private school, um, but not all of them. I, you know, we could look at, um, like I said, you could pull up that thing on the website and they're going to have more specific numbers, but it's not going to tell us everything. So it's impossible to really know exactly where all of those kids are going, but we could figure out at least where some of them are going. And going back to District 7, Ms. Sydney, what is the increased percentage of students making at least one year's growth on the, NA, the NWEA map, reading and math, in District 7? So the most recent data that we have is winter of 2021. And I've actually got that in front of me um, right now. And it looks like about um, 70% are where they need to be um, for our white students. And unfortunately, our Black and Hispanic students are sitting right at about 50, a little bit below in some areas. And so um, that's not necessarily great, but also that's part of our messaging that we need to change because, you know, I've got this graph in front of me. I'm looking at the data. But this is a snapshot, a very small snapshot of what's happening in our schools. And so when we talk about schools, everyone wants to know what's the, what's the MAP scores, what's the SC LEAD scores. And that really only tells us a tiny little bit. Like we're, the way that these, these tests were designed was not to be used in this capacity. It's really for a teacher to look at each individual's test and see where their strengths and weaknesses are to see what that teacher needs to focus on for that particular student. And so we're really misreading the data and using it incorrectly. But unfortunately, that's the method that we're using. And so we do have to acknowledge it and learn from it. But um, I think we also need to talk about the racial bias that comes in standardized testing and even the racial bias that we've had in previous curriculums that we're using. I think that EL is a much better um, program when dealing with racial bias than ones we've used in the past. But it's just, to me, it's really unfair. You have a student who's made incredible gains, but then they miss their goal by like a point or two. And then we as a society turn around and say, oh, well, you failed. No, you've done amazing. That teacher's done amazing to get that student there. That student has worked incredibly hard to get there. And so we can't just look at MAP scores as a definitive, like I said, it's just a tiny little snapshot of what's happening. What racial bias has been taught in the curriculum, in di particularly in District 7? Sure. So it's across the board. It's across the nation. It's everywhere. We can, you know, zone in on District 7, but it's going to be true for every student. Um, anytime that you've got a program that's being designed by white people, <laughs> um, there's going to be a lean towards that bias. So language that's used, examples of um, in stories that are used, there's all kinds of different things that are they're being targeted to a white audience because that's who's developing it 
not necessarily intentional. It's not like someone's like, oh, let's make these tests to be racially biased, but it happens. And so I think education is just now starting to really address that issue and intentionally make changes in how we teach and hopefully testing will eventually catch up as well. Um, but it's just going to, it's, that's something that's going to take time. But when we're talking about test scores, when we're talking about our students, I think it's super important that we acknowledge that and not just say that our um, minority students are failing. It's not fair to them. It's not fair to those students. It's not fair to their teachers. And how many of those minority uh, students are actually failing right now in District 7? Yeah. So we've got um, the 2001 winter scores. We had about 35 that were testing, that were in the um, top percentile. And so that's a pretty low number. That's pretty, um, if you take it at surface value, that's pretty scary. But if you really were to go in and talk to those teachers, I, you would see a different story being told. Now, uh, how many of the students in District 7 have actually, you know, scored or meets, meets or exceeds on the South Carolina College and Carol Air Ready Assessment, ELA and math in the past four years? So I don't have those scores. Um, they are not on the state report card that I could find. Um, and so it's figuring that what part of that is public information. Um, I think we could eventually get that information, but I could not find it last night for you. Oh, no worries. Now, what percentage of the students have actually scored, met, or exemplary on the SE Pass Science and the SE Pass Social Science in the past two years? Um, so the same is that I don't have that information. Um, but, oh, wait. Maybe I do. Hold on. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, it's, it's going to be pretty similar to our math scores. It's going to be um, a little bit over 50% for your white students and a little bit like around 40% for um, your minority students. But again, we need to talk about the racial bias and all of this testing. And uh, so I don't, I just, I, I struggle when I'm talking about test scores because it's, it's not the most important thing that's happening in our schools. Unfortunately, it's being focused on like it's the most important, um, but it really doesn't tell us very much about the student as a whole. What are the students' weaknesses and strengths academically in District 7? Sure. Um, I don't think that you could put a specific label on every student's different. You know, every child is going to thrive in areas and struggle in areas. So this student sitting next to you isn't going to be having the same struggles that you are. So to say that, oh, students in District 7 are great at science and bad at ELA or vice versa, it's just not an accurate statement. Um, we can talk about our different programs. We have a great language arts program. We have a great math program. Um, we are offering STEM and science and social studies. And so I would say that we are offering great programs across the board and we just need to make sure that we're meeting our students where they are. Where are you meeting the students where they are in District 7? Yeah, so that's going to be that's going to come back down to the teachers. Okay. So you, every teacher knows their students. They know their students' strengths. They know their students' weaknesses. They know um, how each student learns, you know, so the student, some students in your classroom are going to do better hands-on. Some students in your classroom are going to do better visually or auditorily. And so that's going to come down to making sure that our teachers have enough autonomy in the classroom that they're able to make those changes to meet each student's specific needs. So that's the one issue that comes with curriculums is that sometimes it's too structured that we can't address specific needs of our students. 
So, but that doesn't take away from the good things that these curriculums bring in. So we just need to make sure that we're giving teachers enough autonomy that they can adjust and change as needed to meet each child's individual needs. Now, going back earlier to obviously what you talked about was, you know, classes and the class sizes. Let me ask you, smaller classes would raise student achievement by what percentage? Um a lot a high number you know you that comes down to giving individualized attention to each student and so when you have overcrowded classrooms a lot of different things happen you're going to see more behavioral issues be, just because you've got more students in there and it's harder for teachers to make those relationships if you have a class of 35 versus a class of 20 um and so what we know is that students act out in classrooms where they don't feel safe. So if they feel like they don't have that relationship with their teacher, that's when they're going to act out. Now, that's not to say that every incident is teacher, or, like that's not what I'm saying. But like if a child is knows that they have a relationship with their teacher, they are far more likely to go to them after class and talk to them and be like, this is what's going on in my life and I need help versus you're just a number in a room and then you're angry and you have all of these mental health issues that are building up on top of each other. And if you don't have that space, it's, it's like a pot and it explodes eventually. You know, we have a huge mental health problem across the district and in district seven, we, we need to make sure that we are giving these children safe spaces so that they can talk with their teachers. We need to make sure that we've got adequate mental health in every single classroom. We need to make sure that each school is providing opportunities and spaces, um, to decompress when a lot of times it's just these emotions they build, they build, they build. And if this, if you leave that building tension in a room and then it will explode. But if you give those students an opportunity to walk out, calm down, talk to someone, get those, um, get, get it out. Then a lot of times we can just stop it before it happens. Mm. Um, also, class sizes, you have 30 students and instead of tw 35, instead of 20, then it's harder for those teachers to give that individualized instruction. So just like we were talking about earlier, every child learns differently. Every child needs different things to help in the classroom. And it's a lot easier for a teacher to adjust to 20 different ways of teaching versus 35 you've only got 40 minutes in a class yeah. and you've got 35 students there's you know there's only so much that you can do so smaller class sizes is, is really what would make a massive difference across the board okay Ms. Cindy, let me ask you this how small is too small and for how long yeah. <laughs> so it's gonna depend on the age um it's gonna depend on the subject mm -hmm. Um, you know, some, there are some types of classes that are just lecture based. And if that's, you know, like if you have a history class and you're just learning dates and names, you know, you can put a little bit more in there. But if you're teaching hands on science, like a chemistry class, you're going to need a smaller number of students. Um, preschool, for example, that's what I taught. Um, when I first started teaching, we had 20 students in the class and that was, it was amazing. It was fun, but it was too much. Like, you know, like we did a great job with them. I'm not saying that, but it's really hard to give four year olds everything that they need because they need everything mm -hmm. when you have 20 kids in a classroom, even though there's two adults. The first year that we came back from COVID, that number dropped to 10. Mm -hmm. And at least in my school, that was too small. We have a very high Hispanic population. And one of the amazing things about our preschool classroom is the immersion with the English language. So the year that I had 10 students, we had far more Hispanic speak, um, students than we had English speakers. And so we did not progress them logistically, linguistically, as far as I would have liked um, just because they didn't have that same immersion experience. 
Then we switched over and now we have 16 students in our preschool class. And that is the perfect size. It's um, enough students that they can learn from each other. It's a small enough number that we can make sure that we're giving everyone the care that they need. So, you know, to answer, to go way off and answer that question, um, it's just going to vary depending on what you're teaching. And, and how much does it cost to actually reduce that class size? A lot. It costs a lot of money. You know, when you um, when you reduce the class size, that means you're bringing in more teachers, and more teachers means more salaries. Um, and so, you how know, much that cost, how much would that cost District Seven if you reduce that class size? It's gonna. I mean, I'm gonna be honest. It's gonna cost a lot of money. Um, I don't know the exact dollar amount, and it, that would vary based on how many classes you shrank and how many teachers you brought in. So there's, I don't know what a specific number would be, but it would be expensive. But, you know, one of the things that I've been trying to, to talk about in this campaign and talk about with the public and hopefully make a change downtown is that there's a lot of things that we can do without in a school. You know, like there's a lot of places that we can make cuts. There's a lot of places that the district can make cuts, but a child cannot learn without a teacher. Like that's the most important thing. And we're not doing enough. Obviously, like I walked out of the classroom this year, like we're not doing enough to retain teachers because teachers aren't being respected. They're not getting paid enough. Um, and, you know, so that's, the actual educators are the most expensive part of a district, but they're the most important part. So you put your money where you need it. What is the, te the teacher retention rate right now in District 7? Yeah, so we have one of the highest turnovers in the state. Right now, there's about 4,000 teachers in South Carolina that are walking out of the classroom. Um, Charleston County is... If not the highest, it's either the highest or the second highest for numbers of vacancies. Um, and, you know, if you look at the cost of living, it's not necessarily the price of like what the salaries, it's the salary versus the cost of living. And so like the cities that have a higher cost of living have a higher turnover rate just because it's becoming excruciatingly difficult. Um and but in District Seven, Miss Sydney, where exactly are those teacher vacancies? Um, they're going to be across the board. There, you know, we have a turnover rate in just about every school. And, and, and where exactly? Let's talk about that. What, where, what is the price of living in District Seven right now? Yeah, sure. Um, if we can get brutally honest right now. Um, so my rent is about $1,400 a month. I live like way out in West Ashley. I don't live fancy. Like, um, and my check each month. Well, so you get two checks a month or whatever. My check was without my, I worked kaleidoscope. So um, if you take my kaleidoscope pay off the check, uh, each check was 1300 So my rent was $100 more than half of my income. Um, and so you've got a car payment, you've got electricity, you've got food. It, very quickly, you don't have enough money to pay your bills. Wow. What is that pace of growth that you foresee for uh, District 7 in the next five years? I'm sorry, say that one more time? Yeah, what, what is that pace of growth that you're seeing right now for District 7? And where will that pace be the next five years? For, um, like, expansion of the district? Yes, ma'am. What, what, what is the growth projections, I should say? Let me say it like that. Yeah, so we've got people coming in left and right. You know, everywhere you look, there's new buildings popping up. Um, seven, it, if you drive down 17, every time you drive down there, it's expanded a little bit further out. Right. Same with 61. Right. Like, so West Ashley and Somerville are being, very rapidly becoming one. Um, and so inside of District 7, we're seeing very little openings of, a, you know, it's hard to find an apartment. It's hard to find a house. Um, we are maxing out within District 7 right now, but we're expanding outwardly very quickly. Um, and, you know, in the middle, which is 
district six. Right. Um, but we'll, <laughs> I say that it's complicated because where people live and where they go to school yeah. is the maps don't necessarily make sense, but, um, this, there's a lot of growth happening in the middle of West Ashley, um, especially um, like Carolina Park, oh. Carolina, yeah, the, um, right near Walmart on Beast Ferry. Like everything back there is expanding rapidly. So, yeah, it's a lot of growth happening constantly here. Yeah, I work out there a lot for the restaurant, so I know all about that. But yeah. let me ask you, uh, going back to obviously issues with, you know, some students who have, you know, obviously behavior issues for certain reasons. What was the percentage of suspensions and expulsions in District 7 by race and ethnicity in 2021? Okay, so I don't have it broken down by ethnicity, um, but I will say that it is predominantly African-American students. Um, so at CE Williams, we had 180 in school suspensions we had 151 out of school suspensions and one expulsion um they also had zero school related arrests so for a middle school that um suspension rate is pretty average but then when you do break it down by race it's shocking um i i could get you that specific number but it was majority african-american students so that's something that we really need to talk about and address if you look at west ashley high school the numbers actually drop a little bit we had 129 um, in school suspensions we had 137 out of school suspensions we did have two expulsions but the sh like the really shocking number to me was that we had 90 school related arrests and that is an incredibly high number so we need to figure out what is causing that is it fights and if so is that something that we can address with more mental health is it drugs if so we what can we do to get preventative initiatives going on inside that school if it's um you know other you know we need to think we need to figure out that number it's unacceptable to have 90 students arrested in one year and zoom unfortunately give me less than a minute because we've been on for at least 40 <laughs> minutes unfortunately but I want to get you back in the fall because I want to talk to you, obviously, about the things that you want that you think the school district can actually take out of its budget and actually help with student achievement. I want to talk about the mental health and more about the suspensions and obviously the racial bias. But yes. Sydney, uh, Sydney Van Bulk, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome to Quentin's Close Ups. Thank you so much for having me, Quentin. This was a, this was so much fun. Well, thank you. I appreciate it greatly.